that creative experience and what is created is itself the healing thing, um, the therapeutic thing. Welcome to the Ruth Stonehouse podcast. I'm Bianca Stone, and I'm super excited to be talking today with someone who's not a poet at all. Um, James Barnes is a psychotherapist and mental health advocate and writer who lives in Exeter in the UK. So thank you so much for being here, James. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It's it's a pleasure to be on to be on this in such a different different world yet similar world. Yeah. And people may be thinking, how is this relevant to poetry? Uh what the fuck is going on? And I would say I went down a really uh interesting research hole um probably like 5 months ago now. Um where I was trying to find some information on duality and mental health. Um, And I was thinking of duality in a completely different aspect. I was thinking of it in terms of um, poetry and comics coming together. Uh, And I I think I just feel like really interested in the dyad and dualism in general. Um, when I was working on my poetry manuscript. Um, and moreover, I, I came to that interest in duality through an interest in our perceived separation, perhaps perceived separation between um, the human humanity and nature, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak. So, and our, our like anxiety about that. And because a lot of my book, ended up being about that. Um, we're not here to talk about me, so I don't want to turn into that. But um, anyway, all those things led me to um, James's article uh, that was published online, um, how the dualism, how the dualism of Descartes ruined our mental health. So James, I'm hoping you can just start by talking a little bit about your background. Um I know you're a psychotherapist, but it seems to be that you are also interested in philosophy. Was mm-hmm. what what came first for you? Good question, chicken or egg kind of thing. Um, I think I've always been interested in the whole the whole gamut: um, psychology, philosophy, mind, world, all of that good stuff. Um, worked in mental health for a long time. Studied philosophy worked in mental health, came back to philosophy, trained as a psychotherapist, just kind of all over the place in my mind, but also mm-hmm. in the world. I, I lived in uh, San Francisco, which is where I trained well, where I studied philosophy as well, but also trained to be a psychotherapist, um, which is very interesting. Okay, interesting. Ideas, yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Um <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's, it's part, <laughs> makes me think like philosophers similar to poets when they, when they end up going into higher education, studying it, they're sort of like, but is this a job? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas like psycho psychotherapy is definitely a job that is needed. Um, yeah. Yeah. In fact, that that's, that's very true of, of what happened when I was there in San Francisco studying East West philosophy, basically. And in the same school, they, they, it's mainly a psychotherapy school, actually. They um, they had a program that was kind of interesting and philosophically oriented in a certain way uh, to train to be a psychotherapist. And I was thinking that very thought when I was in the philosophy program, like, what, what am I going to do with this? Especially as it was because from a very, right. very interesting, you know, kind of independent school. Um, it really is going nowhere. It was for me to sort of indulge myself. And then I saw the link. And thought actually, I'll combine this with my you know interest and experience in mental health and do something quote unquote practical. <laughs> Is it how much does philosophy factor into like psychoanalytic um, theory or well, probably it factors into theory more than um, but just in the education aspect of it does that. Is that is that a common crossover or? 
No, no, I don't think so. Not well. It depends. I think these days with psychoanalysis in particular, it gets very philosophical because it's quite a mature mm. subject, so to speak, and it's gone through a lot of um, you know iterations and crises of identity and all of that kind of stuff, and has increasingly become philosophical and inward looking and the kind of models that you have now are very very different to freud's and they get they they get actually, they get kind of quasi mystical i would say a lot of it it's quite quite interesting um it's where you get a crossover with with poetry i feel particularly yeah, yeah that's where that's why i sort of got so excited about this is that i had no idea um, the evolution of psychoanalysis and but of course it is. of course it has been um, I just we get so locked into our own occupations and genres that we don't really know what's going on with everybody else yeah um, but but then we come across these moments of uh, you know articles or um, books that that we do I'm like oh my god that's just like in poetry mm. Um I, you know, it makes me think about all the misconceptions that we have about um, therapy is a lot like the misconceptions we have about poetry. Um, And like, for example, thinking that like, you know, therapy can't offer me anything or I, you know, I'm not interested in getting, you know, when, when you're clearly in a crisis, but you're like, I don't want to be in therapy because I've done it before in the past and I didn't like what it was like and it Hmm. didn't help me um and then but realizing that 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 there's many different kinds of approaches Mm -hmm. to therapy and um just like there's many different kinds of approaches to poetry and the way that people practice it um and I think people are very adverse to poetry a lot of the time because they are they think of it as a, as how they learned about it in grade school. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, the education of the arts is, uh, is sorely lacking, um, obviously in its, in its, um, depth and, um, nuance, like beauty. So it's like, I feel like a lot of the work I do as a teacher is sort of like undoing people's like, ex- like previous understanding mm-hmm. of what poetry is or can do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, to- I totally relate to that. I, I feel similarly in-, in the stuff that I write. It's really, although I do have my own ideas about sort of positive contributions, which I try and make, increasingly trying to make, a lot of it's just trying to dismantle all the, all the things that, firstly, things that came before, but also just the, the kind of caricatured understanding people people have, not through their own fault, through what's presented to them, Um You know, and in that, you know, people are kind of a classic thing of kind of being taught, you know, Freud being this very old thing, which it is, um, but that it's kind of a thing of the past. And we've become very scientific now and we've worked out what mental disease is and mental disorders are. And, you know, it's, it's all kind of it's all been kind of figured out. And we have these technologies and therapies, all of that, that whole narrative is um, forecloses on a lot of stuff. Uh, much in the same way as it sounds like happens in the the poetry and the arts world. <clears throat> well, it's interesting to think of it as the if it's all fixed and figured out and we've got it all down, then we're never really asking any questions and opening ourselves up to the possibility that we don't know everything and that maybe our approaches aren't exactly the helpful in the right way or it's not moving us forward like intellectually um or psychologically yeah i think it has the which kind of gets out yeah go on oh, it's just, i think it has the purpose of precisely uh stopping that you know it's a it's a way of dealing with existential anxiety in one way or another to try and convince yourself that you figured things out um, particularly logically and scientifically and that that a uh, sort of appeases terrible almost psychotic anxieties going on underneath culturally psychotic anxieties about the complete unknown uh aspect of um our own minds and understanding of reality which is i i 
come to find like completely terrifying. Um, but because, but that's not, but, <laughs> but it's also the truth and it, it get moves us forward. Um, I, you know, turning towards your, your um, paper that you wrote, how did you, how did you come to the idea of, of dualism? Um, what made you write this article? Why did you um, make this connection? Hmm. Um, well, the first thing to say is that I didn't choose that title. That was that was Aeon's title. I probably I, I didn't want to exactly call it that, and I'm not sure. Dualism and Descartes is an important part of the story that I tell. But the sort of broader story is the kind of disenchantment from the world, which is very related. They're kind of two sides of the same right. coin. Um, but I think that I I've really always been interested in that that. Um, that question of what experience is and what the world is. And I think it's quite, quite obvious to me from a young age that the world is not this kind of mechanical, um, you know, bumping up of atoms and animals are, you know, vacant, vacuous robots walking around. And it, all of that just seemed like utter nonsense to me, really. Uh, well, very, very abstract. Um, yeah. And so, I, I mean, ultimately, over time, I just kind of wanted to hunt that down, you know, chase that story, understand how it came to be and why it's so powerful and uh, persuasive and why, is it, why it's gripped us for so long. Um, and one key place to end up going, going into that story is, is Descartes and around that time, the 17th century and the Enlightenment and all of that, and he's a big figure in that as is his dualism, um, just kind of what I just try and describe in the article. Yeah, we should sort of, right, let, we should give some sort of context to your argument. Um, uh, I, I guess I could read a, a piece out of it. Um, uh, that towards the end of the Renaissance period, a radical epistemological and metaphysical shift came over the Western psyche um, in response to the advances um, of Copernicus, Galileo, Francis Bacon, that posed a serious problem for Christian dogma and its dominion over the natural world, um, which in itself doesn't seem like such a bad thing, you know, it's, uh, uh, but I guess the, the, Descartes' dualism of matter over mind was an ingenious solution to the problem this created. The ideas that had hitherto been understood as inhering in nature as God's thoughts were rescued from the advancing army of empirical science and withdrawn to the safety of a separate domain, the mind. Um, so it's this separation of mind and matter mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that which makes me think too of the mind and body i mean is that is that the same as the mind and, yeah. and body sort of dichotomy yeah yeah there's i i'm trying to write something now actually where i split it down into three three dualisms one of them is mind body the other is the separation between subjects between humans and then the last or actually the first is the separation of humans or the mind from nature. Um, and I think the way that I frame it in that article, and it's kind of like, I mean, it's a story essentially as well, because it's obviously very, very complicated, all these things that happen. Um, but prior to that, prior to that era, um, and across the world now in most places, you know, it's, it's not an old thing for the majority of the world. Uh, kind of mind, mind and world are, are entangled. You know, that this idea that we have a kind of, we perceive or, or this idea that all the qualities that we see in the world are kind of in our minds, sort of projected onto this neutral scientific world. That's something that arose then. And that's something that, that's something that didn't make any sense before that or in the rest of the world 
you know, right now in many ways. Um, and that there was this kind of like, um, ambiguous and dynamic relationship and experience between yourself and your mind and your experience in the world. And you're kind of participating in something and creating something. And there's kind of ambiguity and paradox and all these things are kind of central, which is um, precisely because what's real is between two things, you know, it's, there's, is a kind of creation of two mm -hmm. things rather than, you know, there's one thing over there and then there's one thing here. Um, and so there's a, there's a kind of experience and a time which, you know, you can visit with hallucinogens or, um, the, the psychotic will often talk about exactly the kind of entanglements and, um, you know, mm. world with mind and mind with world and how, how it's all kind of jumbled mm -hmm. up and interpenetrating. And it all sounds very kind of like mystical and um crazy in a certain sense well just even that yeah because it's like science was like well we we're not even going to consider like people don't consider the mystical as like an element of science mm -hmm. um or even an ambiguous territory of um uh nature as something that's more than just yeah something we're like looking at under a microscope um mm -hmm. which you point to the fact that we had to do that in order to make certain advancement advancements because we were so probably in a way like uh there wasn't a lot of questioning going on before mm -hmm. where it was like well that's just it's just god made this you know like mm. um we don't really have to investigate that, but it's the, the, such the stark, intense, like divide between it where now they like don't touch each other at all yeah. is almost like just having the one, it's just like before, except now it's flipped. It's like, um, whereas mm -hmm. before it was like, you know, I, I feel the same way as this is like maybe a tangent, but I feel the same way when people are like, I don't believe in God. And they're like, so like, they don't even want to consider or talk about any sort of like, um, uh, spiritual or mystical mm -hmm. like element of reality. And I'm like, well, to me, that sounds like someone just being like, I only believe in God and I don't want to talk about anything mm -hmm. else. Right. Um, whereas like, there's this, like you said, like it, the reality seems to be in the middle of two opposite opposing forces that, mm -hmm. um, I mean, even this idea of opposites is sort of like, I was just reading, um, uh, William Empson's the seven types of ambiguity, which is like, such a hard read but um but he he did mention in one little spot that like this sort of idea of uh opposites was sort of like a relatively new human idea mm -hmm. um, yeah i mean it's it's abstract it's it's total abstraction you know that you don't find opposites in nature you just you, you in outside of you know with a difficult you end up falling back into the categories that, that I'm trying to not, or I'm talking against, but um, yeah. Well, contradiction I mean, seems completely part of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I, I think that I think you're you're really onto something talking about it in terms of in terms of opposites in that way. That there's this kind of split, you know, in in the the sort of Christian religious world where everything is one thing and then you split to its opposite. Um, and they are kind of mirror images. Well, it was sort of like an early uh, divide in um, early Christianity. Like the original Christians like didn't think of, uh, didn't think in these dualistic terms that <clears throat> we recognize in Christianity nowadays, which is that mm -hmm. like good, bad, um, heaven, mm -hmm. hell, evil that that god is the one who um knows and we do not know um so our whole like and of course like our whole society is like kind of based on um the religious the christian side that won out in the end um but uh <laughs> 
where to go from there. I wanted to bring, it might be a good time to actually bring in this. Uh, so this is like a whole other can of worms, but uh, a, a really incredible article that it talks about this crossover that you sent me. Um, that talks about Bion's concepts of negative capability and faith. So mm-hmm. like Keats's idea of negative capability of being able to be in uncertainties within a poem mm-hmm. is critical to the creation of poetry. Um, I think it's worth noting too that like we're talking about poetry. We're not talking about fiction. We're not talking about nonfiction. Like poetry seems unique in this area of thought um, in, in talking about psycho uh, psychoanalysis um, and philosophy because poetry deals with truth and but also in a place of ambiguity. So mm-hmm. um, poems don't function like fiction functions where it's like you're telling a story, right? So you're doing something completely different. You're not making things up uh but you either at the same time completely not beholden to um truth Mm -hmm. and ironically in that way are able to get at truth more readily um because our yeah go (laughs) yeah go (laughs) it's it's uh, no i was just gonna say i mean it's such talking about this 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 stuff, you know, it's like really playing with the kind of the nature of how we how we make realities um, over over the history of the West is kind of what we're doing, and it's it necessarily very kind of complicated and confusing, and there's all sorts of rabbit holes and but all sorts of dead ends. Um, but I but the link that you you're making now to the to the article, to the psychoanalytic article and negative capability, that seems to me very relevant to what we were just talking about. Um, Cause it's kind of, it's, it's almost like a pre-scientific or post-scientific way of being, you know, where, where knowledge is precisely not about um, locating something definite. Um, it's the opposite. It's kind of like, um, you know, letting truth come to you almost. Um, and, and that, that has, in my mind, a lot more, and the way that you're framing poetry has a lot more in common with this time, this pre it sounds bad, pre-scientific time, but the time before the Enlightenment, um, that there's a kind of mode of being, really, that's kind of, that, that is the mode of being. That is how you experience the world. Um, and, and that's exactly what gets kind of split by science into ultimately into poetry and physics, you know, these kind of two opposing, although obviously physics has got complicated these days. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. That, that, yeah. That there's, that there's a link here between this kind of non-dualistic, pre-dualistic, pre-scientific time and how you're talking about poetry and also how psychoanalysis thinks about what's going on in in therapy. Yeah, so let's be specific about what's going on in therapy. Um, In this article on negative capability and faith by Giuseppe Zivaretis, He says, both negative capability and faith enable us to grasp the paradoxical nature of the analytic situation. The field chosen for research is scientific, but at the same time, we postulate a a necessary estuel of the logical functions of thought in favor of intuition. For the analyst, the advice is to be open, receptive to the new, the unexpected, the unhoped for. Mm-hmm. So like, as like a psychoanalyst, like you'd be sitting there like adopting this, um, this position of, uh, he, he uses the word oscillating, um, thought mm-hmm. where you're not, mm-hmm. 
you're sort of doing away with everything you learned before and being completely open to what is being said. It, exactly that. Yeah, it it comes from, yeah, from Bion, and um, he wrote a paper called Memory and Desire or, or something like that. And his his whole his whole argument and purpose was to completely to try to completely forget everything that had come before and to just go in absolutely fresh and just kind of like mm. acquiesce to the to the um really to the to the to the interpersonal field which is inherently kind of ambiguous and confusing and you can't know and when you do know you don't know kind of thing there's all these kind of plays right. <laughs> ambiguity and paradox and but but that I, I guess in some way, although I don't remember reading it, it, it comes from the the conclusion that when you kind of psychoanalyze analysis itself, this trying to figure things out and locate things uh, in time and space is just kind of another sort of defense in the end. And that mm. if you let yourself go in it, then something can happen, something organic can happen, something creative. And that, that creative, um, that creative experience, and what is created is itself the healing thing, um, the therapeutic thing. Um, it also reminds me of Winnicott, who's al always close to Beyond. Um, he wrote a book called Playing and Reality, and for him, you know, playing the aliveness in playing is kind of like. Is, is kind of like the freeness and purity of being. And in, in some sense, we're trying to get back to that. And, it, and he says something like psychoanalysis is just the grown up version of playing. And that you're just trying to mm. create this space in which two adults can kind of drop everything and, and, and play or create something together interpersonally. Mm. And that, that just doing that is what is therapeutic. See, that is incredible i mean i i people do not i i think the average person doesn't understand that that therapy is something that's not about you going in there and lying there and being fixed but mm -hmm. it's about the therapy is actually the interaction between the therapists mm -hmm. and the patient and what happens in there is the therapy like mm -hmm. I, it seems simple when you say it out loud but it's like i think I, I think that's sort of like, I mean, that's not how it was before, right? I mean, that's the point, right? No. Therapy wasn't like that before. Um, but the way you talk about it, too, is like literally exactly how one both should approach poetry mm. and the way that one should approach writing poetry. Mm. Um people come will come into a reading a poem and they'll say, I don't understand what this means because they're, they're, they're seeing it as something. They're, they're not seeing it as something that they're creating with the poem. Like they don't see it as a space where it's two things creating together. They see it as this is something that's supposed to be giving me information uh -huh. so right. that I can have information so that I can like understand something. And it's like, yeah. Like it's meant to be a description of objects or the objective mm -hmm. world, like rather than um, creative, inherently creative, conjuring something. That's amazing. To, um, I, I think it, it 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 definitely feels important to say that there there you know that there's a lot of psychotherapy out there. And this, you know, we're talking about kind of modern psychoanalysis, which is, and not, you know, it actually goes back some way, but it's very kind of most fashionable now in New York and San Francisco in particular. Um, but, you know, the, the general stuff out there and the narrative of psychiatry and CBT and all of that, it's it's kind of the opposite of it, you know? Um so a lot of therapy oh, is, yes. yeah, a lot of therapy is that you might walk in there and they'll they'll sort of, you know, want to diagnose you and then want to 
um, you know, give you some homework <laughs> kind of thing. So it's, yeah. 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 And it's, I mean, well, we see how people are not being helped, you know, it's like, it's, it's so heartbreaking actually. Hmm. It's like people want, I mean, there's something so beautiful in the idea of creating something with another person, a stranger even, um, who's completely open and receptive to everything that's coming out of your mouth, um, that doesn't want you to come in there with all these rules and ideas about how you should feel and act. They're just completely allowing you to, mm -hmm. like, be... I don't know. It's, I mean, it couldn't be needed more right now. Mm -hmm. And if we're so, how lucky someone can be to be able to find someone to talk to like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm actually reminded of something I was reading. Um, in something that you wrote, I'm not sure where I saw it, in what, um, but about how kind of the, it, in relation to your poetry and your work, that, um, that there is this kind of, well, I'm assuming this part, but there is this kind of tremendous freedom in it. But then there's also this kind of like, there can be a terror, you know, and, and it's it's so nice this idea of this person just being totally receptive to you, but that can also be horrible. And I, I mean, I've, I I went through my own analysis of, the, of this kind, and a lot of it was was just kind of really hard. Really, it's, it's you know, given that kind of freedom can be paralyzing as well. <laughs> I mean like the hardest thing ever. <laughs> like, I don't think it could get harder than that. Um, in a personal like effort. Mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously it's like looking towards the thing you're most terrified of. I mean, it's going to be there either way. Right. I mean, yeah. um, doing the work, uh, Doing the work has such an incredible payoff, obviously, because you move forward through it. Um, you evolve and change. Mm -hmm. I feel like, uh, well, you must change your life. Um, it's, I feel like people want so badly to change and we're all sort of obsessed with like improving or changing or becoming better. And like, we don't understand how to do it. It's like, I've, I, even like even this so-called self-care that's that's trotted out all over the place online is like in, in a way it's like a form of self-harm it's like completely avoiding the real work and it feels like just full of um uh, of self-defeating you know feelings of like i'm not i'm mm -hmm. failing at this i'm not good enough blah 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 um, cause you're also like mm -hmm. doing it on your own. Um, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but it's incredible yeah, it, to it think that, it, yeah, go on. There's like a delay. That's no, no, you go ahead. Weird, but... no yeah, I'm done. You go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, a thing I think is from Gestalt psychology um called the paradox of change which is a, a, a sort of simple way of tying that up of how um you know change comes from kind of accepting or allowing what's already there um mm. and that we're kind of that there's that sort of fundamental paradox um at the heart of things but we're kind of desperately trying to grab on to sort of future states and future changes um that never really come. Um, 
Yeah, it's like always a hypothetical fantasy of change, but you're never accepting what's what it already is. Mm-hmm. In fact, telling yourself that it's bad over and over and over again. Um, you know, when I'm doing manuscript consultations with people right now, and it's weird, it's like it's like I feel like a therapist because I'm like reading these manuscripts, and it's like. I'm like, wow, you're completely avoiding the real poem here. Like there, this is clearly about your mother, you know, this is clearly an entire book about your mother dying. And I, you know, I, you're like afraid to write about it. You know, it's, it's like all these distractions about, and they're really things that they think they should be writing about, which are uh-huh. very universal in poetry. And uh-huh. it's like, I can spot it right away. You know, I'm like, okay, well, this has already been done by so many people. This is like, cliche um Uh and you're uh you're really afraid of your own um mind and your own ideas Uh um because i feel like our default is to say that our own ideas and feelings and thoughts and contradictions are not okay Uh and they shouldn't be shared Um, right and the the succeeding or realizing yourself as being somebody other than yourself you project it into the future that's the person i'm trying to be and want to be and you you try and achieve that as opposed to it coming from you um yeah i mean that's so accurate oh my god i yeah i'm (laughs) it's so true wow well, I think that's a good place to stop um, this conversation, which is not over at all by any means, but um, it's just, thank you so much again, James, for- uh, Thank you for inviting me. For, yeah, I think this is important. So. It's fascinating to talk and I, I'm really, um, I'm really happy and, and, and open to talking to you about all sorts of things because it's, there's, there's such kind of crossovers of usually kind of segregated worlds. And yeah, I agree. It's important. Seriously. And I think it could, you know, there's, there's so much good that could come of this crossover for both sides. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So this is just the beginning folks. You're going to get so much more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. I'm going to stop now.